it's interesting, this morning as I was working out, uh, I was looking at a commercial, right? And for most U.S. men, right, what are the commercials we look at? We look at commercials on barbecue grills, right, as important. Trucks are usually an uh, important part of our, our, our television. And, and then uh, a third are lawnmowers, right? Okay. So Ed from the UK lawn is uh, not a garden, right? So it's a big proper, proper thing to mow here. So um, during the commercial, uh, it was a John Deere commercial. I'm not sure who, who's, seen, who's seen the commercial, but it's quite interesting. It says, uh, in the commercial, it says, it's not about how fast you mow, mow being mow the grass. It, it's about how well you mow fast. So it's not about how fast you can mow, it's how well you can mow fast. And it's very unique because I think we get at loss in, with technology many times in that saying, we need this technology to actually do something. And technology has provided a great opportunity for us and has improved our product productivity significantly as a community. But what I'd ask all of us to do, and really one of the themes of this presentation is, really focus on the requirements, because the requirements are key. And whether we're in the professional world or the consumer world, it's all about the requirements. And technology may or may not fit. What we're finding, which is, is really a change in this industry, is the consumer world is starting to drive more of us in the professional world. In the past, you know, if you look at, if you look at um, the space industry, for instance, the space industry drove significant technologies, say in food processing, uh, being one, into the consumer world. Okay? So it drove from the government, drove from a technology, drove from academic base into, into the consumer world. Some of us in this room are old enough to remember Tang. Remember Tang? Pretty awful drink. But the bottom line is, many of us grew up drinking that. That was driven from a different requirement and out to the consumer world. Today, it's, it's really changing, whether it, be, whether it be with Google, whether it be with Microsoft. Uh, you're seeing these changes, right? Um, you know, I have a, another technology story in the ed. And you'll hear from Ed later, so I like to pick on the Google guys. But uh, you know, few people know this is you know there's a, a group of us who are psycho who line up in line when Apple comes out with their new device. Right? There's those of us who have adopted technology for whatever that productivity advantage is, and some have adopted it pure out of flexibility. So Ed and I were doing a talk in Singapore. I don't know if he remembers this, and my computer died. And we were, I was right before, right, I had to do it right before the presentation. I'm like, oh, bugger, right? I, and, and here the presentation, I, so I went to Ed. Ed said, no problem. Slapped it into his Apple, right? Now most people in Trimble have Apples, okay? Not because we're a bunch of psychos. The, the fact was, my computer died. Ed loaned me his, his Apple. And from that, I just propagated, started using Apple. And so it was one of flexibility or need. So look at the requirements. It's essential we look at the requirements, and especially as many of these consumer devices become more prevalent. If you look at our history or our legacy here on the left, right? So for those of you who are Americans, on the left-hand side, we have four presidents carved into a, into a big stone. Three of them were surveyors, okay? And the other one, arguably, Teddy Roosevelt, was probably a GIS or a geospatial person. Okay? So we have a very, very rich history. Okay? If you look at the 10 Deutschmark, right, at the, that Deutschmark had a picture of Gauss. And the and and back of that Deutschmark, it had actually the first network that was ever adjusted using least squares. Very, very complex network and by far the father of geospatial estimation in my mind, right? So, long, long history. Uh, this is a picture in Williamsburg, I think, is as surveyors. I'm a surveyor, so, that, so I have some slides here that have a very surveying aspect. 
But as a surveyor, we all like to dress up like the old days and go recreate something. So this is in Williamsburg. So we throw on a set of wigs, get a whole bunch of, put on some knickers and, and, and go out and recreate a boundary. But we have a rich, rich history. And that history was defined around primarily land development. If you look at us from a geospatial aspect, we really were focused around land development. That, that was the reason we existed, right? Lincoln ran around surveying, Washington ran around surveying, putting in boundaries, looking at land development, either, either land to acquire or to grow, but land development was our, our basis and mapping was very much, very much our basis. Now you take a look on the right-hand side. These things are flying all over the place. And they'd be flying more around the, all over the place if you didn't have some idiot who to, lands it into uh, to Heathrow or lands it into the capital. But these things today, you don't need to be the president. You don't need to be the most famous mathematician in the world. You don't have to be on the Deutschmark to actually operate one of these. Right? And you need to be a maker, right? Anybody here of the maker movement? And you can build one of these and slap a camera on it and start to and start to collect data. Now, is that data good enough? Sometimes, sometimes not. It's us in this room, it's us as geospatial professionals that need to look at and we need to become that data manager. We need to authenticate that. We can try to legislate this all we want and say only a surveyor or only a geospatial person or only a photogrammetrist can collect this data. That's a waste of time. You are going to find more and more of these devices out there and they're going to be collected by people who are non-geospatial uh, professionals. And we need to look at how do we analyze that data because that's our strength. When Washington ran around out there surveying, it wasn't just the being outside clearing line surveying. He was doing a lot of interpretive work and a lot of analysis. That is still an important part of our job. Going back to the John Deere commercial, we need to know what the requirements are, but we need to diversify our businesses. Can I have surveyors up here, but it can be geospatial professionals as well. We need to diversify. Land development is still a very big part of our business. However, oil and gas, mining, construction, all new areas, all areas for us to grow. Strength comes from that diversification. You need that diversification to be strong from a business aspect, both in the solutions you offer as well as the industries you deliver. It's one of the big, as, as I'm on the talk show circuit, the biggest thing I push is verticalize, verticalize, verticalize. Don't be dependent on one vertical market. There are companies who made great businesses on oil and gas. And when oil and gas was $100 uh, US dollars a barrel or $80 a US uh, a barrel, they made a lot of money. As it started to approach 25, they laid off a lot of people. So they lived in a very sinusoidal business model. You look at companies that survive these downturns, they're diversified. And diversified both in solution as well as in market. It's important for us as geospatial professionals to continue with that diversification. If you go back to the four guys who were carved into that mountain, they would have used just a certain set of tools. The tools have changed significantly today, whether those be consumer-based tools or professional-based tools. But they're diversified in, we used to just have lasers, or we used to just have a total station that measured an angle and potentially a distance measuring device. We used to just have GPS, okay? Imaging has come back. For anybody who's a photogrammetrist in the room, okay? Photogrammetry, what used to be cool in the 1950s, okay? Then nobody thought it was cool for a long, long time. It's cool again, from a trimble aspect. If you're a photogrammetrist, call me. We need photogrammetrists. Because as Ed and his bunch at Google or the Apple guys collect this stuff, we need to look at how do we put it in a form 
that's actually useful and is actually able to be used for that particular market. So photogrammetry has, has kind of been re-engaged or, or re-amplified. Problem is, at the university level, you're not seeing a lot of students come in that area. If you want to look at what we can do for this industry, start to drive the academic institutions. Just look at North America, start to count the number of programs that have surveying, or the number of programs that have photogrammetry, or the number of programs that have geospatial today versus 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. We're seeing a decline. And the part of that is that it's hard to get that student base in. People think of photogrammetry of somebody geeking out on interior and exterior orientation or turning a couple wheels. Okay, it's no longer that. Surveying's not just measuring a bunch of angles and measuring a set of distances and getting that sunburn. So we as professionals need to communicate to these new people who are coming out of school. We need to encourage them that there's more to life than gaming. If you look at the deliverables today, the deliverables have changed. If you look at those four guys who sat on Mount Rushmore, their deliverable would have been a paper-based map. It would not have been something digital. It would have taken hours and hours and hours and hours to probably compile. They didn't even have rapidograph pens at that time. That would have been a huge technology advancement. So, the deliverable has changed. This is from Mississippi. We're working with a company or with a nonprofit called SciArc, where we're trying to recreate the Atlantic slave trade routes. So we're we're going out. We're actually surveying those and uh, creating educational material. The requirement is to document those sites. Remember, let's go back to the John Deere commercial. Is is to document those sites and then also document them in a way that they can be rebuilt. Okay. And so with that requirement, we said, okay, we needed to use scanning data, and we need to use surveying data, and we use the imaging data, but then we needed to bring it into a CAD platform so that model could be created in case we ever needed to reproduce that dwelling in this particular case. So again, look at the requirement. We could have easily went with a smartphone and walked through and done some imaging, and there's 8 billion different cloud viewers on the, on the web today, right? And from one of those 8 billion, we could have done the same pretty picture. But again, what is the requirement? Let's focus on that requirement. GIS, I mean, GIS today, right, is in your pocket. It's that mobile phone in many cases. But it has limitations. Yet today, that, that, GIS, that GIS on the mobile phone, probably less than 10 meters. Okay? In some cases, with some averaging, maybe, say, 2 to 5 meters. And I'll talk about why some of those, some of those accuracies are there. But it's a useful device for when you need that level of accuracy. 20 years ago, to think of even having a mobile phone that did email, and a mobile phone, first 20 years ago, thinking of a mobile phone, my first mobile phone was a big bag motor, Motorola phone that plugged into my cigarette lighter. Okay. So, so today, you have a phone that can do email, it can take images, right? You look on, if you go onto the App Store for, for, for Apple, you can look at a number of surveying applications. But again, what are we trying to use, use this for? Manufacturers have now taken many of those consumer-based products and put them in different platforms, whether it be with an Android operating system or an iOS operating system or a Microsoft operating system. They've created a hybrid system. Why have they created a hybrid system? In many cases, it has to do with ruggedness and display, right? Because a lot of our work, we work outside, Potentially, you need a, a better view from an outside perspective, or if you drop it, or if you, uh, you're out in the middle of a rain or a snowstorm. So it depends on what your requirements are. Again, consumer devices are here to stay. Consumer devices, there's billions of them sold a year between tablets and smartphones. 
increased penetration in those devices. So they're here to stay, but let's focus on where to use them and where not. The other important part is how do we, how do we as a community drive those consumer devices to become more applicable to the professional world versus just blindly accepting those commercial uh, uh, devices. Commercial devices, okay, these have been around for a long time. Okay? The, the ones I'm showing here are primarily GIS, uh, GIS based, but the important part is you're now seeing a continuum of a solution. Right on the left hand side you're seeing the solution that is a traditional smartphone. And that smartphone may have some little grubby application you wrote for a specific uh, application, or it might have one you purchase or your agency utilizes. Okay. The, second, the second one is you have one of these um, consumer devices, being a smartphone, and you put some contraption on it. Right? And that contraption usually is an antenna or a G GPS or GNSS receiver. And that contraption then usually gives you more accuracy or more versatility or whatever. Okay. The third is a more integrated device where that manufacturer may put in an operating system that is more a consumer-based operating system. So you have the similar look and feel. You also have the ability to, to integrate with other applications. I think this will be the life. I don't believe you're going to find in the future a continuum where it's all consumer devices or it's all professional devices. You're, based on your requirement, you're going to see this continuum. And I think you're going to see a continuum that even still has these contraptions that fit on it. You know, just take a look at Apple, right? That as soon as they change a connector, there's a new set of contraptions that have to be created, right? So for us as, as geospatial professionals, let's learn where on our continuum, right? Where on our continuum, what are our requirements? And then where on that continuum is the right solution to actually meet, to meet those requirements? Why do we need accuracy? Okay, this is just an easy exercise here where we, we just collected data through a normal consumer device and then one that had either a contraption or a, a plugged on top of it or it had a uh, more integrated approach. Again, it depends on what we're trying to do. Also, that not, that's not blindly just accept the technology. I don't buy it when I'm following a mapping algorithm and I drive into a lake. Sorry, I don't blame, I don't blame that navigation system on it. I should know that there's a lake coming up. How many of you used a map? Anybody in here ever used a map before? Did you blindly drive into a lake? How many? Please don't raise your hand or you make a round. Okay? But how many do that? We need to use all of the tools that are available to us. Okay. Technology is important. Technology has changed our lives. Some for the better, some for the worse. But let's make sure we use the right solution for the right problem. And remember, this is how we differ from Siri. We have a mind. So use it. Okay? We need to. Requirements. Okay? There's the accuracy requirement that we talked about. You know, again, consumer devices, let's just say less than 10 meters. We can argue um, on that. There's multiple people who are doing research on it. Do I believe you'll get centimeter out of a cell phone? Absolutely. I don't know if it's 10 months, 15 months, or five years, but absolutely. Okay? The question will be how we package it for your requirements and how we utilize that. Okay, the question is, how much do we want to package in one environment? So say you're doing a centimeter accuracy, you're recreating George Washington's boundary, and then you get a call from your girlfriend. Okay, what's the priority? Don't answer that one either, guys. Okay, so the, the thing is, we need to look at how much junk we actually want to put in one of these platforms over time. And how is it valuable? So the big thing you find on the commercial-based devices um, is display. So 
readability. So regardless of smartphone that you have or tablet, you find some are better, some are worse as far as reading out sound. Okay. As manufacturers, whether it be Trimble or Leica or Topcon or whomever, a lot of focus is how do you have readability outside because a lot of the work from a geospatial aspect is, is outside. So that's one, one key. The other one is ruggedness. Okay. How, how important is, is ruggedness to your solution? I'll give you an example. I talk, a customer five or six years ago said to me, you need to change all your stuff to the to the to an iPad, and um, and they were pushing me very very hard and said, okay, your software has to write on work on an iPad, and they kept hammering me, and I said, well, but it's not rugged, blah blah blah. And they said, listen, Bryn, I can throw away the iPad for six ninety nine versus buying five. I can buy five iPads basically for what I have to buy one of your ruggedized handhelds for. So that's not as important to me. So that depends on their requirement. That customer didn't mind throwing <laughs> away an iPad. Okay, so again, difference, you will see differences on, uh, di based on organization. Many of you, uh, if you have an iOS device, would be able to, to take a look at this. Is, but there's, there's a bunch of radio buttons that say, hey, do you want to use Wi-Fi, or do you want to use cellular phone, or do you want to use GPS to position? Do any of you have an idea, Ed, don't answer, how accurate that Wi-Fi position is or that cellular phone position is? It may not get you in this room. It probably would make you late. Okay? So there will be a radio button of, do you want centimeter or do you want submeter? But we need to know where it came from. What was the source of that correction? People wonder and say, okay, Bryn, why can't you just do it right away on the cell phone? Actually, antenna is the biggest thing, just to give you an idea. And so that's something we need to push manufacturers of these mobile devices are, as we adopt consumers, is there's an ability to put an external antenna. Very, very important aspect. The reason for that is multipath. As that GPS or as that satellite signal cruises from its place in orbit, and it hits some object and it's, it's then reflected to the antenna, that's multipath. Okay? Big problem. It's one of the holy grails for us in the satellite business. How do you reduce that? It's reduced a lot through firmware and there's a lot of reduction through, and primarily reduction, through antenna design. So antenna design, important aspect of that. You see positioning services, right? 20 years ago, the Coast Guard came out with the beacon system that allowed me to get meter level positioning via MSK beacon, wherever I could get, uh, primarily in the coastal areas, get access. Revolutionary. There are now services that provide you centimeter level. Okay. Our devices, our consumer devices, need to be able to collect that data, be, need to be able to receive that data. This will be important on the autonomous vehicle aspect. Right? It's different if you run over some kangaroo versus you run over some poor person. Right? That'll end the autonomy game. Okay, so that services is an important aspect. And that will become a part of this. Customized data. Okay? Applications. You're going to see more and more cottage industry of applications coming around that you can get on either the Apple or the Google or wherever store to be able to put those on your, on your consumer device and be able to do something. Again, just search the Apple store today and you can see the different, uh, the different surveying uh, applications. No need to go to school, you just, go, you just download those, right? But that's, the, that's the, the issue that we need to deal with. Again, 2 billion plus. I think in 2014 there were 2 billion, 2015, 2.3 billion. I'm sure you're probably 2.5 billion of these devices out there. What do we do with all of that, those devices? How do we use those to our advantage as geospatial engineers? And how do we validate the data that actually comes from them? Our strength, if any of you want to get carved on that mountain, if you want to get carved on that mountain with those other four guys, our strength is not going to be in the collecting of the data. It's probably not going to be in being president either. It might be 
and actually interpreting the data and being able to use the mass collection from consumer devices to solve our real world problems. You're seeing multiple automation services today. Okay? Again, everybody and their brother's building a drone, everybody and their brother's flying a drone. That drone data now can go directly out to a machine to allow you to do some work. That's the vision. It may not be here today. Will it be here tomorrow? Of course, it's going to happen. We need to be prepared for that. We as geospatial engineers who used to go out and fly a set of data and then process that data and say, oh, this is so hard, it was cloudy this day, blah, blah, blah. People are going to wait. Just like I didn't wait in Singapore when my computer died, I went from Ed Parsons' uh, machine to the Apple store and I've been an Apple ever since. Not because I'm in love with Apple. I need a computer. So these services are going to become more and more available. You have uh, Google Tango and you have uh, Microsoft HoloLens, um, uh, Facebook has the equivalent. You have this new mixed reality platform. This wasn't designed for the geospatial community, sorry. It was, it was anybody know Minecraft, right? It was, it, was, it was for that kind of stuff. But today, whether it be Google Tango or Microsoft HoloLens, what you can do now is write applications because we know the domain. We can write those applications to do things to say, what's behind that wall? I need to repair that electrical outlet. Should I come from that side of the wall or this side of the wall based on the rebar? So it's important that we know that. It's important that we're involved in these consumer uh, based products and then how we utilize those. We are transforming the way the geospatial business is done. We in this room are. We need to decide how we do that with consumer devices and more importantly what are our requirements and let's use the right tool in the right place. Don't drive into that lake because your mapping algorithm tells you to. We're not that stupid. That use the tools available. If you see the lake, don't drive in it. Thank you.